Hi, I'm Luna. Welcome to day two of Moth Eaten Reels 2024's 31 Days of Horror. Today we'll be discussing the feminist satirical thriller from 1975 based on the book of the same name, The Stepford Wives, from the same author of Rosemary's Baby, Ira Levin, interestingly. Disclaimer, this was one of the movies that I watched beforehand when I was very delirious from illness, so there are going to be some muddy details in terms of plot. But it's okay, we're not here for an entire plot rehash. Just go watch the movie. It's difficult to come by, but if you can get hold of it, watch it yourself. Not the, 20, not the 2004 version though. So we start with that nice 1970s long intro credits. Joanna and her husband Walter and their two children move away from New York to the simple, quaint, twee town of Stepford in Connecticut, apparently. I don't remember that being stated in the film, but there's just some extra trivia for you there. Joanna and her husband Walter and their two children move away from New York to the twee town of Stepford, Connecticut, where all the women are just perfectly splendid. Walter seems to have joined an exclusive men's association before they've even fully settled in. And with two other new residents, Charmaine and Bobby, Joanna starts investigating why the women are just so particularly impossibly perfect. So I don't think that this film in particular is very striking with its aesthetic and mise-en-scene. Um, we're, yeah, we're getting professional now, we're saying mise-en-scene. I think that it still manages to translate a sense of wrongness around the women. It would be really bad if it didn't, because it's obviously supposed to be a feminist satire. Um, however, I think that for the most part, I would have expected maybe a little bit more dedication to the kind of clean, white, frilly, doily decor. I don't remember it actually going very ham on that, but I think that part of that is then actually the slow build horror, that it's not supposed to be something that a lot of the men would pick up on. So when Joanna explains to her husband that the women are just too damn perfect it's then almost easy to also fall into his gaslighting as an audience member and say no yeah it's not that weird however i will say that it does then create a great contrast with the scene at the end when the thriller has bubbled up into its conclusion and we get some very good classic gothic horror imagery there's a lot of darkness and light and shadow usage I don't think this was intentional, but who knows? That's the fun thing about film. Everything tends to be intentional. But I did like how the banisters created this shadow on the walls that looked like razor blades. And I don't think that then there is subtlety by the end of all of the wives together in the shop. I think that that's something that then follows the aesthetic that I was expecting from the get-go. Because they definitely have a sort of uniform about them. Everything is very high-necked, very long skirts. Traditional, conservative, demure. It's definitely feeding into a particular type of gothic, um, a particularly American type of gothic, which is the suburban gothic, focusing on a lot of kind of homogenization, um, conformity, and still with an invasion narrative threaded through. I don't want to spend this entire ramble talking about other films, but you can definitely see the influence that this movie's had on movies that have come after it. Jordan Peele has made clear direct statements about the Stepford Wives influence on Get Out, which I love to learn about because the finale of the movie also has the newest Neighbours moving in, Be Black Neighbours, and so it feels like a launching pad for where to take that narrative of homogenization and conformity. So it's me again with a last minute edition because I wanted to mention how I thought that this film was also quite uniquely American. The suburban gothic elements are quite distinctly American in a way that I feel like you couldn't really replicate within a British landscape. But then when I thought that, I did think how this also kind of branches off from a little bit of folk horror. We see in The Wicker Man someone who comes from the mainland to an isolated community. And then furthermore, how the Cornetto trilogy actually also uses that as a launch pad in The World's End and Hot Fuzz. And these two films actually also do get across that level of conform 
everything must be a certain level of perfect and the same and twee and idyllic and homogenized. But yeah, that was just the thought that I had that was interesting and I wanted to make sure that that was in the video in some form. Thank you. I do wish that I'd had a time to rewatch this, not only because of the delirium, but I feel that it is one of those movies that threads in a lot of jokes that aren't fully funny until you know the context of what's happening. Um, in the first scene before the credits start rolling, there's a man in New York carrying around a naked woman doll. And Walter, the husband, says, this is why we're moving away from New York, which is quite sinister in that funny way. And as soon as they move there as well, one of our main women, Carol, she brings over a lasagna. She trots all the way across this field with a Le Creuset of lasagna, which has a weirdness that you can laugh at, but it becomes more sinister when the next time we see Carol, she has a car crash and just seems... She's not hurt. She keeps telling everyone she's not hurt in a very repetitive way. She says she's not hurt, she's not hurt, very monotone. And then later on at a party after this car crash, she goes around everyone and says, I'll simply die if I don't get this recipe. I'm enamored by her, I love it. And there is something that makes me really sad about the way that without the twist of how all of these women have been made to conform, she has this thing that she shares with Bobby and with Joanna, our main woman, who they ask her about her life, like, is she okay? Because they're very concerned about the way that a lot of the women seem robotic, very dampened down, very vapid. And she says about having previously alcohol problems that really destroyed her life and her marriage and her relationship to her children. And so that's the kind of thing that feels grounded again, like you can believe that. I do, I wish that there had somehow been a way for me to go into this one just completely with no awareness of what the film was about, because I think that I would have been curious how much I would have genuinely fallen into the gaslighting of the narrative, because there are so many things that, as I say, I, in a way I wanted them to be more punchy, but I think that I would say that that is because I had a full awareness of the satire and the themes that they wanted to be going for. It's definitely interesting to explore this movie's feminism through a modern lens. Obviously this is half a century ago now, 1975, and there's a lot of things that I am aware of at the time from studies in school mostly about second wave feminism and how it handled a lot of things. These days it's something that sends alarm bells ringing because there's a kind of um, focus on the gender binary. Um, there's a lot of, What feminism still gets accused of, of just pure man-hating, bra-burning, all of this. Um, not to then say that second wave feminism doesn't have points, because frankly, I'm, I'm telling you right now, like, I'm just not educated on it. This is, this is historical to me. And it's important to note that there was debate even at the time amongst contemporary feminists when the film came out. Some claiming that the film was inherently misogynistic. But it definitely still has value in this age. I think especially when I'm recording in 2024, we've had a big wave of a rise of trad wife content from women who really want that to be their life. I think that then it's interesting to see how certain things haven't changed and the things that have. As much as this is a feminist take, all of the significant figures involved in the making of the film, including the author of the book, are men, so that's another thing to take on board. However, I would say as well that satire is just something that's so difficult. Honestly, I think that every time that I watch something that says satire, I just, I just use it as a buzzword to keep in mind. I never know if it's a good satire or a bad satire. It's just that tricky of a thing to get across, I think. I personally am of the mind that you can't discount a feminist message just because it comes from men. To me, they did do a good job of portraying that this was not really desirable. I think because we get to see Joanna so early with this passion for her photography, it's something that she clearly wants to continue when she comes out of New York. She has a dark room set up and 
when she meets Bobby, her first friend, she's dressing 20 years ahead of her time, they're having a good time, and they happen to be slovenly on top of that, but they're vivacious, they're bright, they're fun to be around. I felt watching it like I did want to be their friend. Something that the two of them come up with together is the idea of them getting to know the women that they don't understand, and so they come up with a women's association, a counterbalance to the exclusive men's association, she encounters the men's association quite early, and I found it really creepy. I expected the main character to also find it creepy initially, but as I say, one of the things about this movie is it's very slow burn. I find that that's just a thing in a lot of 70s movies. But there's a guy there who just spends the entire meeting when they're just very men's conversation. <laughs> My brandy. <laughs> he just spends the entire time drawing her face feature by feature. I think that there was a convincingly weird focus on drawing her eyes. And also for me, again, because I was very aware going into it that it was meant to be a feminist satirical piece, I was then taking note of the way that it was like he was picking features. With this meeting of the Men's Association alongside this, we also get a look at some of the other major players is in the men's association, the police chief, and a guy named Diz. Why is he named Diz? It's short for Disney. So named because he used to work in the animatronics. An early hint as to what might be going on with the women in the town. She's cleaning in the kitchen, and he comes in, sneaks up through the door, and then when he's spotted just goes something like, I love seeing a woman do domestic tasks. And I do have to praise the delivery of this line because there's not any background music telling you how you should feel and he doesn't deliver it in any kind of deeply distinct bassy tones to let you know that he's a creep creep but it's still done in this way that as I say I think it's a strength of the movie that a lot of these little things early on are quite ambiguous and you sit and doubt yourself for its intention but launching off from the picture that was being drawn Another interesting thing that is tracked about her early on is her voice. Another one of the men from the men's association comes into their home and says that he just wants to record some words from her. Claiming a fascination with accent, man would have loved the Tumblr accent tag. So we have these two instances now of specific body parts and traits of a person being tracked. We have another major friend who is new to the area and is vivacious and they play tennis together, Bobby Joanna and Charmaine. Charmaine is the first to be replaced. Something that she comments on immediately is her imperfections that seem to have gone ever since she accepted the love of her husband. Uh, she mentions that her breasts are larger with her special double padded bra and she's no longer interested in her previous joys of tennis. I think this is something that then definitely you can't feel so ambiguous about because she has her husband rip up her entire tennis court, which was a big part of their home, and it was a hub for the women to interact and be together outside of their failed women's club. Since they try and talk about things, and every woman they invite seems to be happy to have gone because they all seem perfectly happy all of the time. However, they quickly derail all conversations into talks of cleaning products and there is then this little ditty in the background as they speak like pure adverts. I love that every era just seems to have its own special commercial talk to it, you know. Scrolling through TikTok, you can clock instantly if it's an ad from the first two words just because of how people talk. And so this has a very peppy 1960s. I just use Mr. Jiff's spray. And when they're focusing on these brands with, as I say, this peppy little ditty playing in the background, it is very reminiscent of the classic TV wife. They seem to pop up every other decade, a reminder of just how bad some of these ads were for being the perfect housewife. And so I'm sure this is something that you're all vaguely familiar with. We're on the same footing. I am not a historian of the 70s, but I think that it's something that then I personally pick up on a lot more in this day and age. I don't know if it's something that was deliberately put in to connect with a 70s audience, but the thing about the brand names, 
thing about Disney, I do feel that then that's another layer of the homogenization and conformity that makes its way through the movie. When Bobby is turned later on, she immediately starts going on about Ajax coffee. Oh, a bit of Ajax will perk you right up. I did actually find it very sad at the moment when Bobby was turned because they've been investigating together all this time. Bobby even has ideas, maybe it could be in the water. Bobby, the little rascal, the person they go to talk about the water with is at a university where Joanna says that actually he's an old flame of hers. And the little stirrer keeps bringing up every little detail sneakily about the fact that actually he was the guy that Joanna lost her virginity to. I don't know if this is an example of her being a girl's girl or not. It's homewrecking. They do discover that there is nothing in the water in Stepford, but I think that them showing this background of the past relationship that they had definitely then makes him a more trustworthy source. And so in this environment where Bobby and Joanna are feeling very like everyone's telling them, you're crazy, you're crazy, and they're just not sure what's real anymore, um, this feels like a guy that they can actually trust to not be tampering with results and telling them something different. And during this drive to and from the university, we do then get that creep in of the kind of 70s technophobia as things like computers and automated machines have really started making their way into the average home. It is a bit comedic from this side of the millennia again that <laughs> they're passing all of these places that say computer and there's just a sinister kind of drone to that. But genuinely, I think that there is also the potential for a really good Stepford Wives remake, apparently not the 2004 one, but one that addresses the way that computers and cherry picking aspects of a woman's appearance and manner of speaking can be replicated in such a way. I brought up earlier that we're in a time where actually there's been a big wave of trad wife content. I know I've said I, I was quite ill and delirious and so a lot of things went over my head, but I do also feel that maybe it was a good intentional thing that I, I couldn't tell a lot of the actors apart. I did feel confused sometimes because I was asking my partner constantly, was that the woman with the lasagna? Was that the woman with the drinks? Was that the woman with the tennis court? I know full well that I have a terrible face blindness when it comes to certain movies, but there's definitely then that aspect that it works with the film's themes of homogenization and doppelgangers. We've had all of these hints of computers, animatronics, glitching almost, after the car crash, Carol at the cocktail party, when she says, I'll simply die if I don't get this recipe, and she repeats it to everyone, it's almost like there has been a bug in her programming. At the climax of the movie, Walter has forced Joanna, after her begging them to move house, that she really should see a professional. She goes out of town for this. It's stated at the start of the movie that the Men's Association also houses all of the medical professionals of the area, the shrinks, the general practitioners. And so she drives what seems to be quite far out to speak to this woman who just listens to her and doesn't disregard her fears and anxieties. And she says to her, take the children and leave because Joanna is scared. Joanna says, this is after Bobby, of course. And so Joanna says, no, I can't see you next week because I don't think I'll be me anymore by next week. And so after her therapist has said to her, take the children, she does immediately, she gets home, she sneaks in as quietly as possible, but Walter is in the living room with his drink and says they're not here. So she rushes up the stairs and barricades herself in their bedroom and listens outside for him. He's on the phone with somebody talking about her and a plan that seems to have gone awry. And she sneaks out, she manages to leave and remembers well, before Bobby was changed, she brought her children round to their house and so thinks, oh, this was the night they were going to change me. Perhaps our children are at Bobby's. And so she goes to her old friend's house and I was so convinced by these women's friendship that I did genuinely find this really sad. She tries to talk to Bobby, she tries to reach her in any way, and she cuts herself even when she says, I, I bleed, do you bleed? 
she's frantic and it gets to the point where actually she stabs Bobby with the kitchen knife and Bobby just does not really react. I think we get some sharp strings for, yes, this is the climactic moment where we realize it has truly all gone wrong. And she starts glitching out. She is then robotic and bumping into things, very animatronic like, whereas before it could have been interpreted as something else. I was thinking lobotomy for a little while, but obviously a fantasy lobotomy. But the word she uses specifically is she's bumping into things and pouring coffee on the floor is, I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. And that made me really sad, which I like because I like a horror movie that also makes me sad. But she realizes, of course, that then the children aren't there and she has to leave and that the one place that would make sense for them to be at this point is the hub of evil, the Men's Association. Something that I didn't get around to mentioning. They had a dog at one point, Fred. They took Fred away. But one night when she was out walking Fred, when they still had him, she runs into the police chief and she's looking at this big old mansion, kind of reminds me of every haunted mansion movie ever. Um, and the police chief explains that it was an old building that the Men's Association have since repurposed and brought back to life. So she enters the Men's Association and here's her child crying. Her child sounded weirdly British, as a side note. I, again, I'm either assuming that you will never watch this movie and that's why you're here, or you've watched this movie and I'm hoping you get what I mean. I swear her small American child was saying, Mommy, Mommy. Jarring and a little bit funny to me, but she gets inside, hears these cries of Mommy. And as I say, this scene is then beautiful. This one pops so well visually for me. It's got that really nice high contrast light and shadow. Um, to use another film term so that I sound cultured, as is my mission statement. It's got this chiaroscuro and there's almost a chase scene in these shadows against herself and the lightning is blasting. And oh, cool side note, a storm actually started when we were watching this movie, so I felt really immersed. 4D Stepford Wives, yippee. But she eventually finds the source of the noise and finds that it is Diz sat at a desk waiting for her, presumably, and he has recorded her children's voices. They weren't there. Apparently they were over at Charmaine's but of course this doesn't matter now because now she is trapped in there with Diz and she proceeds to run away as you would. The sending is my favorite part of the movie. I feel that obviously with the backlog was such a slow burn, but then having this climactic chase scene with all of the Gothic archetypes around and motifs because she finds herself running away from Diz and ends up in this room that is an exact replica of her room at home. And then there at her dresser is her. I think I've definitely seen 70s films that go a lot deeper on the body horror and the tension. Um, so that's another kind of disappointment only because of that outer awareness, but it does pay off when we see her doppelganger turn around with these black sclera and emotionless face that does have a hint of a smile and she takes some rope and then off screen presumably she's strangled we get that tense fade to black and then the entire last bit of the movie is the stepford wives with their trolleys with their shopping carts going around the store and waving to each other and saying things very robotically, very chat GPT girlfriend. But I was really holding out hope for Joanna in a way. I think all I do is go into these movies really naive, like, no, that didn't happen. She's okay. Because there's a lot of zoom ins on her eyes in a way that reflects the previous scene way back when of the Men's Associations Club and the man who is drawing her because you know what a lot of his drawing he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere they keep focusing on the eyes as if he keeps redrawing them and Joanna's eyes are focused on in the same way as she's around the store with her trolley and they leave it till last her little chappy at GPT girlfriend hello to her and to Bobby and they have no connection anymore they're all just perfectly splendid and they just have no connection anymore 
we don't get any decisive conclusion to an earlier scene where her photography actually seems to be getting some acclaim. It's a sad scene that I didn't mention, again, because of the entire context of the film, but she goes to someone she admires, shows him her photos, and he says they're good and we, we can do something with this. Um, and she responds, I can't remember to what question, but she says, I just want to be remembered. We don't get a conclusion for if she is remembered after she's been turned into a robot. But it does feel like the actress is still screaming with her eyes even at the end. A dark consideration as well is what does this mean for all the daughters of the town with their future being to be replaced. As Diz says, we do it because we can. So Stepwood Wives 1975 for me, three and a half stars, or three and a half robot wives. I don't know how you get half a wife, but this film made it so. And I'm fairly low rating for me, just because I'm from 2024 and at this point I've seen a lot of its kind. Um, I said I don't think that it had particularly standout direction or art style, but furthermore, I was ill and delirious and spacing out for a lot of it but I would still recommend it. In contrast, I'll see you tomorrow for a dark, twisted, erotic horror. A modern take on Clive Barker's classic.